Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad some of y'all are still there waiting for us <laughs> patiently. Yes. Uh, evidently, we had a nice little issue where we went live and had an issue, and then we started again, and it went to the wrong thing. So now, hopefully, we will be good. Um, let let me click on the magic button to see. It is now back up. Okay. All right. Um, well, we are on a new one, so some of our live viewers may be slightly confused. Uh, and uh, sorry about that. We are on the road, for those of you who cannot tell um, by video. I am actually in Austin, Texas. Um, so right now, um, we're going to pretend I'm staying in this hotel, and I'm not just sitting on their courtyard using their free Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> Yes. Pirating Wi-Fi. Yeah, today's uh, pirates pirate. are not nearly as exciting as old-timey pirates. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Well, to uh, to for those of you who weren't there, which was everybody, uh, <laughs> Ryder and I were just talking about Dune. It was a great conversation. He had some really, really interesting points. <laughs> uh, but he just went and saw Dune recently, and we were <laughs> uncovering the fact that it was indeed a, a book or a series of books which one was it i forget yeah it's a series of books of course the first one got most of the attention uh the author's name is frank herbert uh and there's he just made it so dense uh the book is very fast paced but it it it's sort of you have to sort of i think sometimes stop and take time he'll go through these kind of litanies of things there's kind of religions there's this it's this epic space opera right where they um, basically outlawed certain technologies over time um, to, and then all of a sudden it turns into a class-based system. There's authority and power, and there's this stuff called spice, and it's how they navigate through the stars. So it's very valuable substance. And there's only one planet it's produced on, and that planet is Dune or Arrakis. And so, yeah, that's kind of where this stuff starts coming from. That's sort of the basic plot line. And then the movie just came out, and this is a... Um, a new version of, uh, I guess they did a movie in the 80s or the late 70s. And it, uh, and that movie was really good, but it was done by David Lynch. And of course, it's very much of the time. It's, uh, you can sort of see some things and it sort of, it looks very dated now. Some of the concepts even are, they really had to reduce the movie down because it's of course, like any good novel that has a cult following, everyone's angry, but it's not like more like the book. Right. So this awesome. new one is a lot more, uh, yeah, it's a lot more tuned into the book. But of course, diehard fans like me were like, oh, well, that didn't happen right there. Or that, that was supposed <laughs> to happen and it didn't. And I just, he wasn't supposed to say that at that point. You know, and I can, that's how well I know the series is I can sort of start going meh, 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 nitpicking at it. But overall, the movie was beautiful. It was epic. Um, I think Dennis Villeneuve is the name of the director. He also did Blade Runner 2049. Um, so he's really good at stepping into these heavy cult following movies and making something epic and grand and fantastically beautiful. Like if my biggest complaint was everything was too epic, it was too grand. Um, there's a lot of brutalist architecture in there. So it can be very oppressing over long distances of time. Um, just like 2049, there is just some big cosmic forces at play and sometimes you're just like i just need a break this is all too much yeah well what did you think about having um the 2021 technology and visual effects and things like that do you feel like that made a, a big difference in, in 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 a good way and or bad way yeah i think it made a great difference um there's things like uh Baron Darkunin has these gravity tensors that help lift his bulk up, right? And the way that those are portrayed in this film is a lot different than the way that they were portrayed earlier. It was almost comical the way he floated around earlier. And <laughs> in this version, it's actually quite scary. And then uh, they have these shields that they use. And so the technology for the shields is now, it, it looks a lot better. Um, and, and these shields, of course, like it's high impact, like bullets, it'll block those. But when it comes to things like swords, if you move slow enough, it moves through the shield. So it, it's like an excuse to, in a weird way, they have certain technologies that are higher than ours, but they have other technologies that they have to go back to, such as swords. So it's a very kind of interesting uh, movie. And uh, yeah, it was good. And the technology, the, the scale of everything was really 
it, it dramatic, right? So people were tiny and there is these massive systems that play against them. There's these massive sandworms. There's these massive, you know, nature is massive and epic and it's trying to destroy you at all points. And humans are just these tiny specks running around. And so the way that he portrayed all that was really fantastic. That's cool. Yeah. Once you said the sandworms, uh, it started to jog my memory a little bit um, of maybe seeing at least a trailer or something back in the day. But but yeah, I, <laughs> this is my exposure to Dune as of the last month is like somebody was talking about it and they were like, oh, I think I'm going to go see it. I'm like, oh, that's that one sci-fi thing from a while back. Uh, I wonder if that's supposed to be yeah. good. And then it was like, no, he said Dune, not Doom. And I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Dune. Yeah, that's that one sci-fi thing from a while back, right? <laughs> <laughs> same, same difference. Yeah. Doom and Dune. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, I was talking with a friend and they're like, well, you know, I want to see it. And I was a big fan of it. And, uh, but my wife definitely has no interest in seeing it. And oh, she didn't have any interest in seeing it 20 years ago. And she didn't have any interest in seeing it now. I mean, did, uh, did you go see it with your wife or? We did. And, you know, my wife had seen the, um, earlier movie, but uh, like I've, you can probably tell I'm a bit of a fanboy for it. Uh, and so there's just there's little things that I had some difficulties with with the new movie, some small little changes. But yeah, my wife saw it, and then after we got out, she was like, "Well, you know, I had some trouble with the audio because it's cranked up too loud in the theater. But it would be too loud in some spots where it's like epic sound that's like crushing you. And then at the next spot, then they're talking about these little phrases like fear is the mind killer, right? It is the small death." You know, and they have these sort of litanies that go through the movie that are is mental training to keep you from being an animal. You to become a human, you actually have to overcome fear. And so there's this kind of spiritual aspect that runs through the movie about um, training yourself and overcoming things and being able to handle the destiny and the burden and the weight that's put upon you and stuff like this. And so when we get out of the theater, my wife's like, I couldn't hear what that lady was mumbling the whole time. And then I start reciting it like word for word. And she's like, stop it. You know? So there are these little these little moments that uh, she really enjoyed the movie overall and really liked it. But I think me fanboying on it afterwards might have put her off. Turned to her it, off so. a little bit. Yeah. Oh, it's one of those things um, where it's just like, I like this less because you like it so much. <laughs> yes, I think that's I think that's a big part of it. It's like all these, um, you know, partners are out there going like, you're such a fan that I can't reach the same level. It's like showing up right. at a party when everyone's already drunk and you're like, I, I can't do it. I just can't get into yeah. the groove with y'all. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> well, hey, I actually want to talk a little bit more about that because I think there's a couple of interesting nuggets in there. One, I'd like to talk about like the format of movies and you know watching on the big screen in the theater versus at home on the TV versus on a tablet or an iPhone. Um, and also whether or not you use closed captioning. Um, but before we talk about some of that stuff... Um, I wanted to formally re-welcome everybody, um, especially since we had a, a little bit of technical difficulty. Sometimes that happens on the road. Um, so for those of you who are just joining us, welcome to The Morning Show. I'm Reed Garcia. This is Ryder Richards. And we not are uh, not on the road. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I am in Austin, Texas right now. Um, my friend is playing in a disc golf tournament. Um, he is uh, an amateur disc golfer. Woo! Wait, let's give him some applause. <laughs> he actually, uh, you know, throughout the year, the way that um, disc golf works is kind of similar to golf in that there's a season, you know, a time where the season happens and you earn points throughout that season. Um, and I'm not the amateur. There's a pro series and then there's an amateur series. And the difference between amateur and pro is um, you become pro once you start getting paid um, for those who aren't familiar with that definition. And so um, my friend here has played in multiple tournaments throughout the year and he did well enough throughout the year to get invited to this uh, this thing, which is the, what's this thing called? The tournament? National Amateur Disc Golf Tour Finale. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but it's actually the largest disc golf tournament ever in history um, this year. Um, and partially that's because last year there was COVID, so they didn't have it. So there's 1,300 players um, and... I was looking in the little caddy book because um, I'm his caddy, uh, and uh, that's why I'm here. I don't know if I mentioned that yet or not, um, but uh, it's like some multi-million dollar economic impact to the area and things like that. Uh, so it's like, oh, there's a lot of people here. Uh, so it, it, it's a cool little event. The uh, one downside is it's going to be very windy, 
And for those who aren't familiar with disc golf, you're throwing a, a frisbee, um, which may look a little different than the frisbee you think of, but it's a frisbee nonetheless. And frisbees don't do the best in the wind. They they fly a little bit differently. Huh. That is so weird. Yeah, yeah, it's funny it has, how that works. Okay, so let's, you know, I've played enough golf. I played some golf in high school, and um, you have to have you have to adjust, right? You have to have different strategies. And you as the caddy, like, are you coaching him along in this? You're just like, mm, mm, I would go with the, the five. Yeah, no, I mean, actually, the interesting thing about uh, about disc golf is there's actually, and I'm sure there will be some golf people who roll their eyes and, and question everything that I say, um, but there's actually a lot more variety in the disc than there are in the clubs um, of, of, disc, of golf clubs. Um, you know, and now in this day and age, there's a lot more technology that goes into golf clubs and things like that. So there, there is a little bit more variance, I think, than there used to be. Um, and I'm talking out of my butt here. I'm not a golf, a big golf player, so we'll let the commenters yell at me. Um, but um, with the disc golf disc, like you can have the same, literally the same two discs, and they can fly differently. Because I've, I've tried to think of comparisons before in the past, and the closest thing I could get to is like a hockey stick or a, a baseball glove, you you kind of beat it in to be the way that you want it. And, uh, or kind of like a leather boot or something like that. You, it, it, it behaves and feels differently once it gets to a certain point. And so what happens is you, as you're playing disc golf, um, inherently you're probably gonna hit a tree or something, or you're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna maybe it's gonna hit some rocks or it's gonna skip something and that, the, the discs are made out of plastic, and so they start to deform and maybe chip a little and do things like that. And so, therefore, that actually affects the flight characteristics of the disc. Um, and so, in the, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to go way, way down to the rabbit hole because I could, right? But uh, there's, you know, just like you have in golf, there's a, a driver. Um, you have a certain type of disc you use to approach, which is like when you're in the middle of the fairway and you're trying to get to the hole, get close to the hole. And then you have a putter. Um, and then even within that, like there's a whole bunch of different manufacturers, a whole bunch of different models. It's actually really interesting. And one of the reasons why I really got into disc golf a lot was because there, there's so much variety in there. And it, so not only do you need to decide what type of shot you want to shoot, but you got to decide what kind of disc you want to shoot. And then also in golf, if you play right-handed, you play right-handed, <laughs> but in, in, in Frisbee and disc golf, you you do what's called the backhand, which is you go like this, like kind of this this motion to like Charlie Chaplin it, you know, uh, oh, or, no. <laughs> <laughs> or you you can do a forehand or a flick, which is where so the backhand is like if you're right-handed, you kind of come These across. These look like martial arts moves to me. Yeah, hiya. Disco moves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, why not both? You know, why can't it be I both? Guess. Kung fu fight. But uh, <laughs> everybody was kung fu. Fighting. Fighting. Huh. But yeah, so it is really interesting. And, and some of that is going to be, um, that's going to be really fun today because it's not only am I going to be helping him decide what disc to throw and things like that, but I'll also be making sure he doesn't go into any big t temper tantrums and things like that as he gets all pissed off. And, and then when you throw it in the wind, the wind does something. Uh oh, sorry, my thing was making other noise. Um, and when you throw something in the wind, just blows it completely different like you weren't expecting, then you just got to deal with it. And that's like one of the things we were just talking about is like, look, at some point, you just got to throw it up there and you, you never really know what's going to happen. <laughs> you just can't can't try and control it too much or it'll hurt you. Yeah, I, I do remember doing the uh, when we were playing golf and it would get windy, then you, you'd be these strategies to keep the ball lower to the ground or to um, – just depending on what kind of course you were playing, then you'd have different strategies around things like that. And, and that's really what makes it kind of fun. I know from a distance, it might look like you're just cruising along, just smacking a ball or just throwing a disc. But, uh, you know, there actually is some strategy in it. And, uh, and then the fun thing is actually trying to execute on your strategy, which, you know, you can have strategy all day. But, uh, <laughs> you know, if you don't have the skills for it, then so what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that is very true indeed. Um, so Ryder, I'm actually gonna go real quick and I'm gonna try something out. I've just connected to my iPad and I'm gonna see if I can do a drawing here. So fortunately for everybody who's on video, they're not gonna have to look at our, our faces for a second. So we'll give some people a break from that. Um, so let me switch over to that real quick and change this here. All right, iPad, okay. 
looks good. Okay. Cool. Well, so, you know, this is one of those fancy tools that I just got. Need to mute that. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. All right, writer. So can you see this and can you can you see what I draw? Oh, hey. Yeah. Um, let's see. There's a valley with two suns. Oh, it's a face. <laughs> oh, look at that. What a beautiful, beautiful picture. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. And and just so we're all on the same page here, um, I was nice enough to um, be the one to start drawing, even though I am not the artist at all. It's totally Ryder who is the artist. And now look, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do some little ad hoc here so I can bring me and you back into the scene because I just can't stand not seeing your pretty face, Ryder. <laughs> Jeez. It is really tough. As you put more pictures of yourself up there, I see <laughs> let's how just it is. put Let's just put like five of me up here. What do you say? Uh, why not? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, the just real quick, and, and I'm not going to belabor the point, but I also just kind of wanted to you know, have an excuse to mess around with my, my iPad because it's a tool that we want to start using more as we're, we're teaching on the show here. Um, and so I wanted to, to describe disc golf real quick for the people who weren't aware uh, basically, you start out not like that. Not like that. You start out on some sort of tee pad, and then you have some sort of basket. Uh, and so basically, your goal is to throw the disc a handful of times to get it into the basket. So maybe you throw right there, and that's your drive. And then you throw right here, and that's what's called your approach. And then your last one would be to throw it into the basket. And the basket looks kind of like a... Uh, I'm trying to think of a good comparison. Uh, I can't really think of a great comparison. Have you seen a disc golf basket before? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've played disc golf in the past, and uh, yeah, it it kind of reminds me of a very strange metal trash can that has chains hanging from it. <laughs> like, you know, that something that wouldn't actually work, but maybe it's built to keep raccoons out of the trash in nature, because you always see them like in the middle of the woods, and you're like, what is going on with this odd object? Yeah, if you're ever walking around or driving around town and you see something that looks like that, uh, uh, it's like uh, basically a, a flat wire basket um, that it's, then uh, has a bunch of chains on it. Uh, it also kind of looks like, you know, a person with long hair with their arms held up, cornholio. And, uh, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> yes, so that's that's that. So that's, that's what I'm up to this weekend. And, um, oh... And that is what, um, so that's, that's what I'll be doing the next few days. And it is actually, it's kind of cool. We're, we're going to three different courses. And, uh, so we'll get to play three different types of, of golf and, 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 you know, one's a little more open. Um, so one cool thing about disc golf versus regular golf is you play within the woods. Um, and so you have to shape your shot to bend around the trees, go between these things. And, you know, there's some discs where it's like, you throw it and it starts out where you have the disc kind of angled, you know, down towards the ground. And then as you throw it, because of the way the, the thing flies, it kind of flips up a little bit and it starts to get flat. And so then it goes really straight for a while. And so there's all these different types of shots that uh, we can go into oh, some other time if other people are interested in disc golf. But for the many people who probably aren't, that's probably enough of a primer lesson for you today. So let's jump back um, actually to yesterday real quick. And what did we talk about yesterday, Ryder? Oh, dude, drawing a blank. Uh, this has been happening a lot lately. Oh, what oh well, we you know. About? Well, yesterday we had a little bit of time where oh, we had we... our guests on. Oh man, what a bad good memory. memory I have. Well, I was going to point out how yesterday we tried to remember what we talked about the day before, and I think we also failed yesterday with that one, right? <laughs> I failed. I yeah. I, there were other people in the room who figured it out because that that day was reading and writing. <laughs> yes, largely yes. with the reading, and then the writing we'll probably talk about more another day. And then um, yesterday, which was Wednesday. Um, October 27th, 2021, um, we had our guest Alexandra Mannerings on for the first time, and she is a data analyst expert, and uh, we brought her on, and oh man, I don't know about you, writer, but I'm, I'm really excited to have her on again, because we, we just barely started talking about some things, and there were so many tangents, and so many rabbit holes, and so many different topics that came to mind, where I was like, man, I just can't wait to talk with her about this, and see what her thoughts are, and and yeah, I mean, what, what were your thoughts about yesterday? Yeah, my thoughts were that she was utterly fantastic, um, really fun to talk to, and 
you know, there were some sort of larger conceptual things that she brought up that I really enjoyed as well, just about how how data should be used, how um, essentially that we need to have a decision before we go after data, some things like that, which I would love to just sort of like tease out and push back on a little bit and just see where that goes. Because, of course, she's thought about data so much more than you and I have. We also, I think, at the end started sort of wrapping up and getting into uh, privacy rights and digital rights and uh, data use in that in that sort of respect and and that was all kind of fun i did i enjoyed it that she was working for nonprofits to help them out and trying to find unique solutions to get data into their hands so that they could make more informed decisions i think we started bringing up things like effective altruism or basically making sure that your money that's spent towards charity goes in ways that are the most effective Yes. So for those of you guys who have not checked it out yet, um, it was yesterday's episode, episode 22. Um, and we had on our guest, Alexandra, Alexandra Mannerings, um, and her company is called Miraconos. I'm not going to spell it off the top of my head because I will probably mess it up. Um, but one of the other things we talked about was, you know, uh, I'm just an average person. Why the heck do I care about data analytics? And, you know, we talked a little bit about that yesterday, um, but that's really one of the goals for bringing her on is, hey, let's recognize all of the ways that whether we like it or not, we are either producing data and we're giving off data. And kind of like Ryder was talk, alluding to, we, we talk a little bit about what that means as far as privacy goes. And guess what? You're using a cell phone, you're using a computer, you're using the internet. Like you're, you're always spewing data everywhere. So it's good to know about that from that angle. Um, and then there's other things like uh, health insurance. And one of the things we talked about a little bit yesterday was the importance of having a will. Um, so there, there's a, a whole bunch of stuff we're going to talk about. And talent, right? Yes, yes. So I'm glad you brought that up because our uh, our challenge yesterday was what, Ryder? Do you remember? Yeah, let's see if I can remember. But yeah. <laughs> this is the Ryder memory game. 1920. Yeah. Oh, back in my day, uh, we just <laughs> died. No, uh, yeah, we, <laughs> we're talking about having, uh, you know, making plans, um, researching, looking into what it would take to have a sort of a living will. Um, you know, if you end up needing to be resuscitated, what that looks like. And these are, you know, some of the comments that were brought up during the show. But, uh, you know, how many times do you want to be resuscitated? What happens when you're non-responsive? Uh, what happens if you enter a vegetative state? These are all the, the sort of, it's not necessarily when you die what is happening that we're probably the most afraid of. It's it's maybe being uh, disabled in a hospital for months on end without any real brain function, but somebody's keeping you alive. So really a lot of these decisions or they can seem to be about you, but they're really about your family members and other people who are going to have to caretake you. Uh, so making those decisions now can make the burden a lot um, easier on them because at least then they know what you're thinking instead of having to guess. Yeah, and part of what I'm really excited for with Alexandra in this d discussion is, I mean, <laughs> to give you guys a peek behind the curtain, we didn't have hardly any of that written down beforehand, right? We they just, we were not thinking we were going to yeah. go in and talk to her about wills. And that just kind of happened to come up. And so I'm really excited to get another really smart person um, to be coming on this this regularly. And, uh, uh, and a fun little news for you, Ryder. I spoke with her again yesterday afterwards. She had a good time and uh, she's she's ready to come back on next week. So we, we will oh, be having sweet. her back good. and we'll, we'll, we're hoping to have her be a regular guest on the show. And oh, by the way, we also may have some some content outside of the show where we go a little more in depth um, on some of the things that not, not everyone really wants to hear about, right? Um, but they are very valuable for those who do. So that was the uh, recap of yesterday and our challenge yesterday was around the living will. So if you haven't done that, um, do that yourself or if you know someone in your life, um, especially if you know someone who's very sick or very old, um, then make sure that you get them involved um, and help them out. Um, but for today, let's jump back to let's jump back to the talk about movies. So Ryder was telling mm. us when we first started off that he just saw the new hit blockbuster Dune. How well is it performing, by the way, in the box office? Do you have any idea? Oh, I do not know. I have not even looked. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> this, fine. <laughs> uh, just, yeah. I, I mean, I hope it does terrific, um, but I can see how it's not going to be for everyone because it doesn't function like a Marvel movie. And I was saying earlier how uh, Frank Herbert, his his heroes function much, much differently than the sort of comic universe heroes do. 
Um, there's a lot of sort of spiritual training and hardship that they have to go through and there's destinies that are involved and they have to sort of embody those. So you can have all these ideas about, you know, responsibility and stuff like that that come out in our current comics. But um, his are just, uh, there's something about the daily pressure of going through everything that they go through that is just sort of brutal on these characters uh, and sort of watching them have to sort of face up over long terms and have to watch them deal with their emotions and their emotional states as they're growing up, being forced into situations. And, uh, and all that's kind of painful in the sort of Dune universe, um, which, you know, ours, it, it ends up because they're based on comic books, you know, Spider-Man has responsibility and there's these moments of emotional vulnerability, but then the rest of it's like him just having fun and being a kid is what it, the comic books kind of make it out to be. Yeah, well, I, honestly, this kind of appeals to me more, um, you know, uh, and I, to be to be frank, uh, you know, my bias, I have not I've not given comic books or the comic book movie or the comic book universe a fair shake. I've not really done it in depth yet myself. Um, so that's actually one of the things I've intended to do, especially now on, you know, Disney Plus or whatever they have it where you can watch the whole thing in sequence from chronological order. Um, but um but yeah, so Danielle and I started that a few months back, um, ironically or coincidentally, at my friend's house, who I'm caddying for now, uh, back in May. Mm. But we've only watched one so far um, in the last six months, so that's uh, the pace is moving. Um, but yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I don't know the 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 comic books. They they never appealed to me as much about the, you know, I like an action movie every now and then, right? And and uh, I think the the beauty of what they're doing with the universe thing is, um, and to actually tie into yesterday, we were talking a little about reading, right? And uh, um, whenever I started reading, I started to read a, a little bit more about fantasy and, and sci-fi stuff uh, lately. And one of the cool things I've really enjoyed about fantasy is world building, which is a, a fancy way of saying, as you're reading the book or the series, they are telling you more about the world that these people live in. And the cool thing about fantasy is it's whatever the author wants to design. Um, and in some cases that involves things like magic, um, in some cases that involves, you know, things like people flying or all these random languages or, you know, these foreign lands and all that kind of stuff. So that's one of the cool things is the author can basically paint you this picture and, and build this world. Um, and so I, I've grown to really like that. And especially in series as they kind of develop further and further and expose a little bit more, they peel back another layer of the onion. Um, I, so I, I've really grown to appreciate the world building and also how things tie together. Uh, one thing that some authors do very well is they have different series of books that exist within that same universe. Um, and as you read through them, you can see, oh, this ties together to that and this led to that. And oh, that magic system is here. But then there's this other different part of it there. And so that's one of the reasons why I've now vowed to go back and go through the Marvel universe now that I've grown a little bit and learned to appreciate that world building a little more. Um, and I was like, okay, I think if I watch it in the chronological order, I'll start to see a little bit more of that world building and recognize a little more of those tie ins and get a little more on the fanboy type of level where you start to notice those types of things. And, um, you know, for example, the first one I watched was Captain America whatever i think there's some early year involved i think that was the first one in the, the series and it's like oh you see the crate of weapons and it says stark industries on it and it's like oh that's just like a little kind of plug in this is kind of cool uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah what are your what are your thoughts on world building you know um i'm a big fan of it and i was i was just kind of even rethinking right now some of the things i was just saying earlier and i i think i was actually kind of mistaken one of the things that happens in the comic book world is that I think when the comic books, when you're originally reading them, they could have all these fun jokes and things running through them. But we start at some point, really dark comics started coming out. Um, things like Batman. One of the things that is interesting about comic book world building is that you'll have four or five different versions of Batman written by different authors. And they all kind of exist in the same universe, but it's different takes on the same character, right? And I think it's in like Frank Miller's version of Batman, like he's just slobbering and psychotic and Robin Hood is actually, or not Robin Hood, Robin is just kind of taking care of him, like just trying to keep him out of trouble all the time. And so there's this kind of these other versions of these characters and it gets really quite dark. Um, but, you know, when it comes to world building and fantasy, I think Brandon Sanderson is a really good guy to look at. He's 
uh, got Mistborn series and a he's, couple. He's other... one of the guys I had in mind when I was talking about that. Yeah, yeah, his magic systems are really interesting um, because I think they feel like um, small magics. It's like, oh well, what you can control a certain kind of metal, so what? But then he builds it up to where you all of a sudden develop an entire world and a system of moving through the world that's based off of these small powers. It has to do with how you manipulate this one thing. So this one small change just kind of compounds its effects until you have an entire society built. So it's a little bit more like um, an evolutionary process that's based around one small change. And so when I think about that, it also makes me think of the sci-fi guy, I guess, Adrian Tchaikovsky or something like this. And our friend Danny introduced me to him. But he does some amazing world building based around evolution. Like what would happen if you had an entire planet of sentient spiders? What would that look like? You know, and so there's there's these really fun aspects of sci-fi where they start trying to pull in actual sciences as well. You know, there's some hard science that goes into some of these before they spin off into uh, the, the fantasy land. Um, so I find all that fun. I find it speculative. I find it creative. We were talking yesterday about how fiction helps you develop empathy for characters. I would say that things like science fiction can also help you develop creativity and pushing yeah. out into the future. I really like that mix of, you know, a little bit based in reality and a little bit fantasy. That's why I kind of like the fantasy and sci-fi mix. Um, and kind of like yesterday, we were talking about some of the books that I read um, when I was growing up. And I mentioned Michael Crichton um, in the sci-fi mm -hmm. uh, realm. And that's one of the things he does very well is researches uh, things before he writes the book. And it's like this is, yeah, sure, there may be some liberties taken, um, but it's kind of based in this this fact and this thing. And um uh, and then there are, are, are some books, too, that do, you know, they add fiction on top of things that are kind of real and happening, for example, like global warming and things like that. And it's like, oh, then you start to see how it like plays out. And that's one of the other benefits of, of fiction is you can take the reality that we're in today and extrapolate and say, hey, here is a possible future. Right. And this is what it could look like. Um, and, and that obviously can be done in TV shows and and um, movies as well. Um and a, one example I think I referenced a few episodes back was uh, a Discovery, I think it was a Discovery Channel documentary called oh, 2053 or 2047 or something like that, somewhere in that range. It, was, it came out in the early aughts, early 2000s, and it was based on 50 years in the future. Um, what do we think it's going to look like? 2047 is my best guess. But um, if anyone in the chat ends up <laughs> finding that, please share it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so let's let's transition. Um, so we've been talking a little bit about uh, referencing the movie Dune that writer just saw. We talked a little bit about how what the movie is about, obviously, and, and uh, a little bit how that ties into fiction and fantasy and world building. And uh, writer was pointing out how the movie Dune is maybe slightly a little bit different from um, your stereotypical kind of comic book superhero type of thing and has a has a, a little bit more grittier of a feel and um, and and maybe just a little more attention to the the, the struggle and the grind uh, I, 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 yeah, to kind of summarize something. yeah that's a good way to sort of summarize it I'm I of course am not a film review critic but um, one of the things that sort of yeah, there's there's a lot of struggle. There's a lot of tragedy that happens, but it's also it feels like these implacable forces that are against you. I mean, we're talking about nature. We're talking about empires. We're talking about um, large, massive systems that are basically manipulating you and pushing you around and bullying you. And you're really just a pawn for somebody else. Well, how do you sort of escape that? Like our superheroes seem to just go around punching their way through their problems. Um, that's not in reality how any of this would work. So one of the fun things about Dune is how do you as a small individual gather people around you? How are you, um, how can you use whatever you have, these gifts for good rather than for ill, um, knowing that at some points you're going to have to hurt some people in order to get to the point where you want to get to? Like, oh, it's all these really complicated, difficult decisions. And, and yet you kind of watch it and try to watch these characters try to live with sort of grace and goodness within them instead of just being flippant and punching things. So <laughs> that's one of the things I really enjoy about it. Nice. So um, earlier in the show when we were talking about that, um, 
writer brought up the fact that um, he was going to the movie with his wife and she was saying, oh, it's actually too loud in some parts and too quiet in other parts. So mm-hmm. I wanted to talk a little bit about the format of watching the movie. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? And, and was this movie, Dune, was that one where you were glad to be in the theater with the large screen and the big the big speakers and, and even the crowd? Yeah. You know, I've certainly been in movies where having the crowd around um, can make you feel differently, right? Yeah, we went at like on like a Thursday at 6 p.m. and there was only like four other people in the th- theater with us. And we probably, this is the kind of movie you probably should go to something like an IMAX for because it's just so beautiful. And I think there they would have controlled the volume situation a little bit better at a better theater. Um, so those are the kind of things, but it was one of the reasons to go see this it's because after seeing 2049, the Blade Runner show, then I had an idea of what we'd be getting into. That was another one you needed to see in the theater when it's big epic shots that are just beautifully done and built for cinema. They're built for a theater. I think there's television shows now. There's a lot of things that, for instance, a rom-com, I think you can watch on any format. It doesn't matter. It can be your phone. It could, like You're not after it for the great visuals. You're not after it for the effects. You're not after it for the sound quality. So I really do kind of think some of these big blockbuster shows like Dune have a lot of effort put into the art of them. And to see that in the proper context actually makes the movie uh, more impactful. Yeah. So, you know, especially as I've gotten more into the content production world, um, I've, I've grown in my appreciation of the arts as a whole, um, but also especially videography and all the things that go into it. And that's one of the things now when I, I watch the credits, right? And you see, especially for a film like this, you know, hundreds of people work on this thing, right? And it's like, okay, the sound editor, there's the, the guy who literally is the one holding the mic. There's a guy who has job is to maintain the cable to make sure no one's tripping over it. Like all of the little things that it takes. And it's like, oh, the lighting is just this way. The computer graphics have to be done this way. And that was a cool thing about living out in Los Angeles for a little bit. We kind of bumped bumped shoulders and had some friends who were kind of in that type of space. You know, one of the one of our friends was like, oh, yeah, we did the, you know, all the CGI for Deadpool or whatever. And it's like, oh, that's that's pretty cool. Um, And just uh, so, yeah, so the more you know about kind of how it's made and and all the the stuff that goes into how the sausage is made, it kind of helped me appreciate it a lot more and look for it more. so I, I've grown to appreciate it a lot more. So as far as watching different movies and TV shows on different um, formats, I mean, do you ever watch movies and shows on your phone or a tablet or uh, at your home TV? Uh, or are you pretty much a movies or nothing kind of guy? Or what's it look like for you? You know, yeah, we used to just, um, my wife and I used to go to the theater every Sunday. Theater. Almost every Sunday. What was that? The theater. Oh, yeah, mm. yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. we would go to the uh, local Cinemark, which has like a, on Sundays, our matinees cost like $3 or something. And so you could still see the newest movies, but for a very cheap fee. And so we just started declaring that as sort of our church. And Amen. You, know, you go and you, you sit in the pew and you stare forward and you're delivered a message. And, you know, it's, you, it's you really eat your, uh, your body of <laughs> yes, your yes. popcorn, eat the, eat the body and the sacrament. And yeah. Uh, and also your, with you, your, your blood of corn, which is, you know, <laughs> corn syrup, Coke. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah, blood of it, corn. It, it, I don't it, think I've heard that before. That's funny. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's yeah. I mean, it's, it's almost like we're an Aztec culture that goes back to maize and our maize gods, you know, with all of our, corn and sugar uh implements that are all based around corn but anyway uh, i divert i i you know i digress uh but yeah we we used to go every almost every sunday and watch a movie and it really depended we thought about movies in terms of what we wanted to see on the big screen so yeah we watch netflix on our television at home um but as far as watching things on an ipad or a telephone not worth it like I might if I'm on a uh, airplane flight and they have like free entertainment or something, I might watch something on a small screen. But even then, I tend to just click off. At that point, I would rather be reading a book. I think it's just a more valuable use of time uh, than just sitting there watching something just scrolling past me if I don't really care about it. So I don't know. I kind of have um, weird opinions about productivity and time and what I watch on. And when I degrade the quality so much, I'm watching it on my iPhone. I just really can't care anymore. So and that's, that's why we I'm have uh, that's why we have me on this show to balance out and bring a little bit more of the normal <laughs> and the average in because, yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, 
once you mm-hmm. go to a four inch screen it's below me i cannot read i, I cannot watch mm. uh, <laughs> no no i'm not just giving you a hard time uh but uh but yeah uh for for me i've pretty much you know at home we watch on a I don't know what it is, somewhere between a 56 or a 46 and a 55 inch television. That's one nice thing now about televisions. They're so cheap that you can get a a relatively big screen for relatively inexpensive, which is nice. Um, And as far as watching things on my phone, um, I watch a lot of YouTube videos on my phone. Um, And those are for things that Sometimes you're like, oh, it, it, you know, it doesn't really matter. Like one of the things I watch a lot of is, is cooking um, videos. One, because I'm interested in myself. And two, because cooking is something we teach here at Helpful for Life. And um, for those who aren't aware, check out our course, Kickstart Your Kitchen at kickstartyourkitchen.com. Um, you can level up your cooking game in as little as a weekend. Uh, anyway, so I, I watch both for my own purposes and a little bit for entertainment and then also a little bit of research to make sure I'm, I'm learning things to, to teach uh, here at Helpful for Life. But that's one of the things where like I largely, most of my usage of that has been on my phone. Sometimes it's been on my computer. But then there's been a few times where I've, I've casted it or watched it on my big screen TV. And oh man, you watch some of these food videos in 4K on a big screen, it makes you like them a lot more. You're like, oh, this is nice. <laughs> You ever seen seen some some food videos or movies oh, or shows yeah, where it's like up yeah. close and it's like sixty inches? It's like your mouth starts I watering. Think they, they have a name for that. Uh, yes, they do. It's called food porn. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, and it's very effective at, at what it does. Um, but yeah, so one other thing I wanted to ask about since we we're talking about uh, movies and formats and things like that is closed captioning. Uh, what are your thoughts mm-hmm. on closed captioning? Um, I'm not a fan of it. Um, I, I understand how it functions, and when we watch um, foreign movies, of course, it's necessary um, because, like most people in America, I only speak one language because I don't know why I'm lazy. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm not a fan of closed captioning on um, on movies. However, I do enjoy them on YouTube videos. And that's one of these weird paradoxes where I I think, once again, it comes back to the art of the thing versus I expect my movies to be art and I don't want anything interfering with that art. I don't want something scrolling across the screen that the director did not intend. Um, But whenever it comes to things like YouTube video and transference of information, I love the closed captioning. Yeah, well, I want to point out, first off, if you didn't spend so much time reading your books, maybe you could read another language. Gosh, I know, I know. get productive, would you? Come on, writer. Uh, yeah, I just uh, I just keep doubling down into this one language thinking that it's going to somehow help. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, but yeah, for me, with closed captionings, honestly, there's something that I never used at all until the last few years. And now I've actually found myself using them more and more. And kind of like you, um, definitely when it comes to the information transfer. Um, so yeah, w- the vast majority of the YouTube videos I watch, I listen at two times speed. And you know, we kind of talked about this the other day when we were talking about podcasts or uh, audio books and saying like, oh, people's first reaction sometimes is like, oh man, I can't do that, I can't comprehend. But yes, you can, like it just, your body gets used to it and it just takes a little bit of practice and repetition. Uh, so yeah, so, but reading at two times speed or listening at two times speed, when you have the captions there too, in case you miss a little something or you didn't quite get something, or also the way that I watch a lot of times is maybe I'm doing something else at the same time. You can glance over real quick and see the last sentence or the last couple of sentences and get a little context and learn that way too. Um, but I also use uh, closed captions for, for some TV shows and things like that. Um, I will agree with you. There's certain kinds where it's like, for example, comedy. Uh, you don't want to have comedy there because it messes with the timing and the punchline. And you're like, you see it before they deliver it. Oh, and yeah. it just kind of messes with point. it completely, right? And so we've we've done that before where we happen to have it on still. And we're like, ah, oh, we got to turn this off. This is messing it up. And and then, of course, like if you're you're trying to be really immersed in this really pretty cinematic landscape and or really f- strongly feeling and connecting with someone and looking into their eyes like and then you have to like keep looking down like it's hard anytime there's some moving thing any that's grabbing oh, our attention right it's going to move your eyes down they to have, the bottom yeah they have these little fun things now where they'll say things like birds chirping instrumental emotional music you know it will tell you what's going on feet crunching on gravel and you're just like dad gummit stop it <laughs> <laughs> and it's 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 interesting because you know 
I don't, I believe the original reason, right? The main reason for having captioning originally, well, one, there was back in your day, whenever there was silent films and you didn't have any other way to show things. But then there's also the accessibility aspect, right? For people who are hard of hearing or can't hear, right? Um, So that's, that's largely why those, those types of things exist. But when you're trying to use them like, uh, we are people who don't necessarily need it for the assistive aspect. Those types of things are kind of distracting, but they're also kind of funny sometimes the choices they do. And, yeah. and by the way, if you have it in um, certain YouTube videos, especially ones um, who have a little bit of a comic flair, sometimes there's fun little things that people will put in there, like little notes that are only in the captions, uh, little jokes and things like that. Uh, I've seen some fun stuff done in there. Um, but yeah, there's there's times when you don't want to have those captions on because it distracts you, right? And it, and it, it gets takes away from the things you should be focusing on and you just end up looking down at that bottom line. You've got the 50, 60 inch TV, but you're looking at the two inches of it where the text is. Yeah, it is it is kind of a... Um, uh, there's something about having so many aids to everything we do, right? Like we're we're sort of constantly... It's, it's like having handrails around you all the time uh, and, and we seem to sort of be moving into that. So it, it means easier consumption, quicker consumptions. In an interesting way, we've talked about this attention economy, and yet they want to capture your attention while you actually pay, have to pay less attention. It's a very interesting sort of problem that we're, space that we're in right now. Yes, do we have the technology? Yes, what are we gonna use it for? Use it so to watch more videos, you know, without <laughs> thinking as hard, you know? And, and there's, so there's this tendency for information conveyance to be really quick and easy. Um, and I don't know, I, at times I want to push back against that. I want to say like, no, let's turn this off. Let's, you know, see this in another way. Let's think about this a different way. You know, what would happen if you could only watch one movie every week instead of having like Netflix or something going on all the time, right? To, or YouTube going on to fulfill your, fill your mind up. Like what kind of thing would you choose to watch if you could only watch one thing per week? Um, I'm kind of interested in those questions right now, um, yeah. simply because... I find myself thinking repeatedly about this Dune movie, uh, just like repeatedly, I can't get it out of my head. And and it doesn't seem to have a lot of the traits of other movies that are out right now. And so I'm really fascinated with why that is. And it seems to overpower things. Like we, last night we were trying to watch Squid Game and I was like, oh, come on. Like it starts feeling really hokey to me. Uh, And that's because I saw something that was really art. And the art really just put the other thing back into a completely different category. And so well, now I got to I got to make sure to point out for our viewers at home, you know, this is uh, a case of where there is something called bias. Uh, and, you know, writers nope. is admittedly a bit of a fanboy of Dune. So, you know, if you're out there oh. and like, wow, Dune is the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> uh, I need to go see this right now. And maybe you do. Maybe you do. But this is a good time to maybe check at least one other source besides the guy who admittedly said he's a big fanboy and had his yeah, wife roll yeah. his eye, her eyes at him many times yeah. for that. Yeah. The, well, another th- on this other side, I will balance that out with a. I did ended up doing a podcast on Free Guy, which was the Ryan Reynolds kind of action movie about sort of an alternate intelligence, artificial intelligence, and a sort of. Uh, in a game world. Uh, so yeah, I also like going and seeing those movies and enjoying things like Deadpool or whatever else, kind of anything with Ryan Reynolds in it. I was about to say just Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Yeah. Fantastic four. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Whatever it is. Uh, no, I, green lantern. What? Yeah. ah, One of those. That was the rough one. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, but no, I think that there's, uh, there's a lot of space for multiple things to exist in multiple categories. I think what I'm sort of playing with right now is the idea of, um, input in it, whatever you put in, what is what comes out. Right. And so uh, I've been sort of toying with that idea more. I went from being hyper consumptive, like Reed's talking about listening at two X speed. And I'm the kind of guy who's thinking now about listening at, you know, half speed or listening and pausing and then, you know, really trying to consume that information in a really vital way instead of consuming more, consuming less and maybe having it be more impactful. Yeah. So this this brings us to um, our challenges, which I had two that popped up. One that some people would argue is a little more fun than the other. Um, But so I might be pulling something up on my iPad here. Um, for a second and a second but the first challenge you do not need um, to see the iPad for and that is go watch something that is maybe something you wouldn't normally watch 
maybe for you that could be this Dune thing. Maybe for you that's a rom-com. Maybe it's some something else. But try and find something that you wouldn't. Maybe it's a documentary. Maybe it's uh, you know something that's just uh, completely out of your like. Maybe you've never watched a stand-up comedian before or or a magician. You know, there's all these types of things. So I'll I'll plug a magician for you guys. Um, because magicians are one of those things where I feel like they get this kind of eye rolly type of uh, type of vibe in the culture. Well, real quick, what are your thoughts on right. magicians or writers? Oh, jeez. Uh, you know, I actually like magicians. Um, I just sort of I don't like the um, sort of gothic emo culture that they seem to seem to lean into. <laughs> So I'm thinking of like Chris Angel or oh David okay or, yes there is certainly know, that kind of, that yeah okay I can see yeah, that I'm yeah just like, no, stop, stop, uh, just okay. stop. <laughs> so you need to watch uh, oh man I need to find this uh, I'll, I'll try and find this there's this YouTube thing that makes very much fun of the David Blaine thing um, <laughs> so I will find that uh, but there is some some show where. Uh, what is is it Arrested Development where Ben Stiller sort of plays a Chris Angel type character and he nice. has like a W carved into his beard because it's like part of his name and he just runs around <laughs> being a complete goofball but he thinks he's you know he's always got black eyeliner on and everything else nice so okay so I'll, I'll finish with my my plug at first um, there is a magician who uh, oh my gosh now I'm in a blank of Danielle, if you happen to be live in the comments, help help a brother out. Um, well, if I remember him, I will bring him up. Um, but the the other thing that I wanted to to show you guys. So the challenge, by the way, the challenge on that one: go watch something that you haven't watched, uh, or maybe you haven't watched in a while. Maybe you haven't seen a sci-fi thing in a while, or a fantasy, so on and so forth. Go watch something you haven't seen in a while that that maybe you should give another chance. Maybe that's comic book movies for you. The other thing, let me switch over to my iPad for this one is to change a setting on your Netflix. I actually just did this last week. And for those of you who are not on video, that is turning off autoplay. There are two autoplays that I recommend you turn off. One says, turn off autoplay next episode in a series. And for those of you who do not have Netflix and have not been subjected to this before, uh, basically what it is is you'd be watching a series, a squid game or whatever, and you watch episode two, and then all of a sudden in 5, 10, 15 seconds, the next episode automatically starts playing. And I know some people will have the agency and control to get up and turn it off and do it off, or, but it, or to, to get up and stop watching. But guess what? A lot of people don't. And it's so much easier for you to just watch one more. And that's their whole point, kind of like Ryder was alluding to. They want you to just watch more. It's easier for you to watch more than it is for you to get up and stop because you have to take action. So by turning off the autoplay, it, it, it's you thinking of your future self a little bit and saying, okay, I recognize... I normally watch too many and I fall asleep late and then I feel tired the next day, which I've definitely done that many, many times. And it wasn't until a couple days ago when I turned off my autoplay. So the other one is the autoplay previews while browsing. And that's one that some people may like, some people might not. Like you're you're clicking around and you scroll over something and then all of a sudden it starts playing this preview. It's, that's kind of a personal choice. But the, the next episode on series is one that you should probably turn off, but that's up to you to decide. Now the other uh thing i wanted to find out was what the name of this freaking magician is uh, so now i have to look at my phone one second and then we will one out so real quick when is the last musician that you have seen if you musician, can even remember magician. magician oh probably blue man group i would consider them kind of musicians kind of magicians nice nice combination there yeah yeah i saw them in vegas a couple years ago okay cool um yes and vegas okay. shows are interesting because they're so i mean when you have that setup and they've already put all the energy and work into it and everyone else is putting on great shows then the the hype that you have to get to to put on a good show in Vegas, it's a lot. Have you ever seen Penn and Teller before? No, but I'd love, I mean, I've watched them on television. I would love to see them live. I think you would really like Penn and Teller. So for those who aren't familiar, Penn and Teller is a, uh, a 
two guys. One is tall and big, and the other short and and mousy. Um, and the yeah, actually he doesn't speak. <laughs> and he doesn't speak uh, as part of his act. He talks as a normal human, but he never talks during the act. And these guys do an amazing job, both with excuse me, their smaller tricks, their sleight of hand, kind of regular things like that, but also with their more elaborate, big things. Like um, I'm blanking on specific trips off tricks off the top of my head. Um, but they're very, very fun to watch. And they have a, a running show in Vegas. Um, and then they also have a TV show that's called Fool Us, which is where a bunch of other magicians come on. They try and do some trick. Uh, and then they try and fool Penn and Teller. And Penn and Teller have now been doing magic for, I don't know, probably 30, 40 plus years now. And so they know, you know, all the types of tricks. And it's cool because you get to see a little bit and you get to learn just a little bit. They don't tell you exactly how things are done. But they will say things like, oh, yeah, that's the the Schmitz approach there, isn't it? And, you know, they use these kind of words that are just like around it to where like you can kind of guess and kind of see. And it's fun, like, kind of fun to guess and see if you can figure out the, the, the magic trick itself. Um, but the other guy I wanted to plug. Oh, real quick, last thing on Penn and Teller is one thing I would think you'll really like about it uh, is that sometimes they bring in things like political things and and talking about yeah. these other aspects and they work that into their act and it's cool to see how they use their not just they're doing the magic but they're telling a story and they're doing things along the lines of that as well which i think you'd really appreciate well, so uh a really nice cameo in borderlands 3 they have oh, an entire nice. like hill pit where they're on a boss level that's cool i did not know that teller. Yeah. It's so, so writer, it's, it's official. Um, we now need to schedule our Vegas recording session. Uh, we'll go watch the, sh the show and we'll make bad decisions yes. and talk about gambling and, uh, all that kind of fun stuff. And then the other magician that I wanted to plug, um, and this is someone you could go watch on Netflix. Um, his name is Justin Willman. Um, and a friend recommended him to us and we really like him. He does a good job of of uh, combining comedy and magic. Uh, com comedy magician is a very a very uh, common genre of magician. Um, and he has uh, a show called Magic for Humans. Um, and it's it's really cool and he does different types of, of things. And I think they're like 20, 30 minutes, maybe an hour, I can't remember, but he's got two or three seasons out of it now. Um, and it's the kind of thing where if you don't you don't like the first part, just keep watching because he does different types of bits throughout. And some of it's street magic too, where it's like you're going and you know, that's kind of fun to watch people be amazed or be dumbfounded or whatever, that kind of thing. And so, uh, he, he's a talented magician and he's also a very good performer. So those are the two that I would recommend for you guys, uh, to check out. So that's it for today. Happy Thursday, everybody. Our challenges to recap were, uh, go watch something that you haven't in a while. Um, maybe it's one of these magicians that I talked about. Um, or maybe you've never watched before, right? And then the other one was to turn off that autoplay feature. And I'd showed you how, where it is in, in Netflix. And oh, by the way, you need to be on a web browser to do that. Click on your profile and then click account settings to get there. And I'm sure there are similar things on other things like Hulu and stuff like that. So turn off those autoplay and think about your future self. But with that, everyone have a wonderful day. See you later. Bye-bye.